Well, this is um, the second time in my career that um, I've had to introduce before an audience a person that I've never met. Um, and the first one was Bill Paul. And those of you in the immunology field will know that he is a giant. Um, when I got his CV, I was very happy that I like to lift weights because uh, this was like by far the largest summation of a career that I had ever at that particular time in my life encountered. And um, he met all of my expectations because I admitted that I didn't know him and that I wish I had. And that uh, it looked like his talk was going to be fascinating, and it was. Um, and so um, now we, we are at that juncture where I introduce Robert Langer, who I have never met before. Um, but I know quite a bit about him, actually. I'm sure I don't know as much as many of you. I know that his friends call him Bob. Um, I know that he has the largest laboratory at MIT and perhaps in the world. I know um, that he has more patents than Thomas Edison. I did not know personally that Thomas Edison had many patents. I knew he had some important ones. But I kind of think that there's a lot of them and that they're important. And I know that um, anybody who can publish a thousand papers in a career, no, no matter how long, has much more energy than I do and deserves my complete admiration. Um, it, he most recently uh, was awarded the Millennium Prize, which is a significant recognition, but it's only one of 179 others. Um, so this is someone who is larger than life, and this is why I know about him. I, I read this Nature piece about him recently, um, and, and it was quite amazing to me that um, in the early part of his day, um, I've gotten to push up number 22, and he's already had 14 meetings. <laughs> but he also works out more every day than I do, so I, 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 I'm just staggered. That's really the definition, staggering, um, as I think of, of all of the things that, that Dr. Langer means. He, it should be easy enough just simply to say that he's an institute professor. We, those of us who are from MIT knows, know exactly what that means. Um, and so um, in addition to the fact that I think it is absolutely magnificent that uh, biology and engineering and chemical engineering um, are all coming together in this Koch in Institute that, that the kind of people that we're putting together, it's, it's kind of scary. I mean, I want to be here for the next 20 years and see what is going to happen. Now, <clears throat> it was um, actually in Googling um, um, around a little bit, I, I, I noticed that um, there's another accolade, which I think is a really important one, which is to be the smartest person in Boston is a big deal. I mean, there's a lot of smart people in Boston, and I think that many of them are in this room. But after everything else that I saw in Google, I have very little to quibble about, especially since uh, this claim was made after David Baltimore moved to Caltech. And so um, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Langer, uh, Robert Langer. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. So, as the, so I think as the one engineer that I'll be speaking tonight, um, what, I, what I thought I'd try to do is maybe just give you uh, sort of a, a perspective, a personal perspective on, again, starting back for me as a, somebody who graduated from MIT in the early 70s and what it was like trying to see if, we, if there was a way to do biological research or or and, and eventually cancer research, and it actually wasn't that easy. And then I'll I'll try to go over, you know, to how we moved to where we are today. So let me turn the clock back to the 70s, uh, and you've heard about how the area around uh, MIT wasn't very nice then, and that's actually right. But in chemical engineering, which is where my discipline was, um, what I remember in the 1970s as I was graduating in 1974 is there was a supposed energy crisis. And what happened then is that if you had a, a, a car, you'd, you'd have to pay not only a lot for gas, but you'd have to wait in line, as people can remember, maybe for up to two hours to get your gas. 
But if you were a chemical engineer, the good thing about that was you got tons of job offers. <laughs> Pretty much any oil company in the country would hire you. And so I actually got over 20 job offers at the time. And, and in fact, every one of my classmates, pretty much in 1974, that graduated from MIT, actually went into the petrochemical industry. And so in my case, like I got four job offers from Exxon, I got offers from Shell, I think every oil company, except maybe British Petroleum, <laughs> hired, you know, offered me a job. So, and, and one of them actually made quite an impression on me. I remember going to Exxon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for a job interview. And while I was there, one of the chemical engineers who had graduated was from MIT, was a few years older than me, he said to me, you know, Bobby said, if you could just increase the yield of this petrochemical by 0.01%, he said, that would be wonderful. He said, that would be worth billions of dollars. And I remember flying back to MIT that night thinking to myself, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, and again, and it was confusing because see, if you're an engineer, that's pretty much, and chemical engineer, that's pretty much what chemical engineers did. So in my case, I was actually also interested in education. I'd helped start a school for poor kids in Cambridge. And one of the things I did was develop chemistry curricula. And one day I saw an ad for uh, assistant professor at City College in New York to develop uh, chemistry curricula. So I, I wrote them a letter to apply for the job, but they uh, didn't write me back. But I really liked the idea, so I looked at every ad I could find to do that, and I actually found about 40 different colleges that had assistant professor of developing chemistry curricula, and I wrote to all 40, and actually none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so that wasn't going so well. So then the other thought I had, you know, I really want to use my chemical engineering education to help people, and I thought, well, you know, medicine, that, that's a good way to do that, and, and maybe I could do medical research. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools. Uh, they uh, didn't write back either. <laughs> but then one day, one of the people in my lab, the lab I was getting my graduate degree in, said to me, said, Bob, he said, there's this surgeon over at Boston Children's Hospital named Judah Folkman. And he said, sometimes he hires unusual people. <laughs> he, he actually thought very highly of Dr. Folkman, just I won't say what he thought of me. So I wrote to Dr. Folkman, and he was kind enough to offer me a position. And I worked there for uh, three years, and, and that to me was just a terrific experience. I was the only engineer in all the children's hospital. Uh, my projects were actually to see if I could isolate the first uh, substance that could stop blood vessels, the first angiogenesis inhibitor. And to do that, one of the things that we had to do was uh, develop uh, drug delivery systems, polymer systems, to deliver them to the body. And so those were my main projects. But what, what was really exciting for me also was to me, being an engineer in the hospital, it was almost like being a kid in the candy store. Because what I could see as an engineer were all these medical problems that really engineers were never exposed to before. And, and it was amazing. I mean, because you, you'd start getting all these thoughts about what you could do. Just as an example, like the area I work in is materials one of the areas. And one of the things I'd see at the hospitals, I became curious, how did materials find their way into medicine? And it was interesting. One of the things that I saw was that almost always the way the materials came into medicine were that clinicians were responsible for that. But what the clinicians always wanted to do is they wanted to solve a problem quickly. And so what they do in many, most cases is like say from a medical device standpoint, they wanted to find a material say to, to make an artificial heart. So what they actually did is they said, well, what object is like a heart? And they said, well, a lady's girdle material. And that's a certain polymer. So they said, let's make the artificial heart out of the lady's girdle material. That was actually 1967 at the NIH. So today, 43 years later, that's still what the artificial heart's made out of, the lady's girdle material. Hasn't worked real well. And, and, and the reason for that is that when the blood hits the surface of the artificial heart, the lady's girdle material, it forms a clot, and the clot goes to the patient's brain, they get a stroke, and they die. But if you think about it, something that was designed to be a lady's girdle, it may not be the optimal blood contacting material. 